Welcome to the GDPR Weekly Show, one of the top five GDPR podcasts worldwide. Here is what's coming up in this week's episode. Welcome to episode 132 of the GDPR Weekly Show. While we have our normal news articles at the end of this week's episode, we also have a very special interview with Dr. Jackie Taylor. In an increasingly chaotic and disruptive world of technology, Dr. Jackie Taylor is one of 2019's global leaders and a top 10 global Internet of Things innovator. She doesn't just predict the future, she engineers it. She has positively impacted the lives of over one third of the world's population. 34 million citizens globally collaborate in her cutting edge research. Today, as one of the six data protection practitioners of excellence recognised by the UK ICO, she's here to discuss with me data security at Clubhouse, the ongoing process to find an equivalent to the US Privacy Shield following the SREMS 2 ruling, and a look at EU-UK data advocacy. We would add that this interview was recorded on Wednesday before the update from the European Commission on Friday, which we note in the first article following the interview. So please bear that in mind when you're listening to our comments in the interview about whether the EU was likely to find the UK adequate or not. So following that extensive interview with Dr Jackie Taylor, we then indeed have a news article about the European Commission providing a draft UK adequacy decision, which will, if enacted by the EU, mean that the UK will remain an adequate country for the next four years for GDPR purposes as far as the EU is concerned. We then have news that Leave.eu funder Aaron Banks has lost his data breach appeal. We then travel to Scotland where the Scottish Borders Council has apologised for a data breach revealing details of people receiving free school meals. And staying in Scotland, our final article this week is involving NHS Lothian who have called in Police Scotland to investigate following a data breach. So a slightly shortened new section in this week's episode, but we hope that you will agree with us that the interview with Dr Jackie Taylor makes up for that. And if you have any feedback for us, of course, as always, please email feedback at gdprweeklyshow.com. We do read every single piece of feedback we receive, and where possible, we incorporate your suggestions for improvements into the show. Unfortunately, due to the volume of feedback which we receive, it's not always possible for us to respond to each piece of feedback individually. Stay in. Stay safe. It's a great pleasure to welcome Dr. Jackie Taylor back to the GDPR Weekly Show. And today we're going to be talking largely about Clubhouse, because that's an item which I know has raised a lot of interest from my listeners. Um, But we're also going to talk about some other issues too. And... uh, see where we go. So let's begin, Jackie, by saying welcome to welcome to the program. And obviously, there's been a lot of concern about Clubhouse and a lot of, uh, I'm tempted to say, misinformation about how, <laughs> how compliant or otherwise it, it is in terms of GDPR. So obviously, I think the, the, the two issues which have got people concerned is A, about the actual voice files what happens to them how 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 encrypted are they and how certain can people be that clubhouse is only keeping them for a short period of time Mm -hmm. and i think the second thing is about the issue of where it says you know sharing the address book sharing your address book and then it knows how many other people those people are connected to on clubhouse and i think that's you know probably the second issue that gives people Concerned. So I think they're the two significant issues. So let's take the, uh, I, I, I guess, the, the recording bit first, if, if we can. What's your understanding of what happens there as far as Clubhouse is concerned? So hi, everybody. I'm delighted to be back and uh, great to be with you in, on this, uh, Keith. And I, I've, I've actually said to Keith, I'll come back on some of these emerging it's because I know it's something that, is, that as we, like the Clubhouse ones, they get raised and what's this all about? I think part of the misunderstanding that's gone on is um, Clubhouse is building on Agora. So Agora is a platform that um, effectively allows anybody to do real-time voice and video engagement. What does that mean? First of all, it's not something you can compare with another social platform. We've moved the online proposition for Clubhouse. Clubhouse itself is now the new wave of tools that we'll use online. So that's the first thing to say about it. Why does that matter? Because everything else prior to Clubhouse is all predicated largely 
on on text, mm. what we type, what we post, uh, how we comment. Um, and the thing about Clubhouse is it's about human interaction. It's about that voice. And, and you can build out a video positive on Agora as well. So I think that the first thing we need to say is don't think it's like this or it's like that. It's not like anything. It's a completely new thing. The idea behind it is to get to humans, you know, talking to one another. Mm. So so the, the concept around rooms is you spin up a room. People just see it alive and part of a topic that they're supporting and then they they pop into the room there is a moderation facility there though and the idea being that you know it's like anywhere online anywhere offline people don't always behave people are not always respectful and the the platform clubhouse itself requires that respect so the moderators have some additional capabilities and responsibilities for curating that conversation. Now, the reality of it is they can, at the end of a session or mid-session, depending on what's happened, they can actually report what's gone on. Now, because the way Agora works, you can effectively commandeer what has just happened. But once you close the room, that, close the Agora, that closes the Agora connection. So we're talking about what's happening in a room at a time um, that a moderator has concerns. And generally, it's around, it's in there from a respect point of view. And so I would expect everybody to treat me the way I would treat you. But of course, we all know that doesn't happen. So I think, first of all, it's about supporting moderators and keeping that respect culture um, on Clubhouse. Now, we've all been in rooms where that hasn't happened. Mm -hmm. And, and effectively, at the back end, they have the ability to delete that recording. Now, what are you going to do with it if you have an incident? That's something that's not really been tested, other than the moderator um, gives an account, the person who's, who's um, perpetrated it, and the person who's been on the receiving end of it can give an account, and then Clubhouse can decide whether to keep that recording or not. I don't understand why people are getting excessized about the encryption piece of it, because where online is fully encrypted. In mm. my counterterrorism world, yes. But really, people are actually sat on apps um, that have no encryption whatsoever, or the encryption's been compromised two years ago, and they're still using mm. it. Mm. So the idea that somehow you can throw rocks at something like Club, Clubhouse, well, where would you stop rocks? I think yeah. that, you know, the, the groundswell of, uh, quite frankly, I think a lot of people have zoomed out. And so the idea of having a human conversation like we're doing in a podcast really it's like a pop-up podcast type piece um but but essentially it's sat on the agora platform so for my part you know why why is that an actual issue mm. about the way it's going and you have to understand the platform we've built on and the rules around agora and all the rest of it so so my my question to anybody that's starting and making a fuss about all of this is what's the actual problem you're bothered about um, and some of the things I've seen online are from people that don't have an invitation to Clubhouse. Yeah. I do wonder how much of that is related. You know, you're not on Clubhouse, yeah. and so yeah. you're hearing what goes on. And I've seen posts from people that I know and largely respect about what that's all about when they've actually never been on Clubhouse. Mm. Yeah. So as, as, as with anything, what I always say is any software that you're using that's free is never free. Yes. Essentially, yeah. you're still the product. Mm. So whether it's a clubhouse room you're in or a live you're watching on another platform like Facebook or a, a thread you're interacting on Twitter, if it's free, which they are, then actually you're still a product. Yeah. And so you, as, as a result of interaction on that platform, you've agreed to work that way. Um, and so I would, say, I would I really question what the encryption problem actually is yeah. on a free platform. Now, mm. if I'm paying for something, I would want to be able to determine the privacy rules around everything but i've given away my voice and my contribution in in uh, return for free access to that platform and yeah. i think one of the things we have to be very careful about for anything new and and whizzy like clubhouse is because as i say it's a new way for social to be done a new way for us as humans to connect we have to actually say but on the basis of it's a free platform so what's the compromises we're asking for but but again i think i get back to peace we have something like WhatsApp that was compromised in 2018. Yeah. And quite frankly, you know, if you're making this assertion on Clubhouse about encryption, you're not on WhatsApp then. And if mm. you, are, you aren't on WhatsApp, what end-to-end -end encrypted platform are you on? Yes. Yeah. No. Yeah, so I think we've got to get context I, 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 on this. I, 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 
I think that's a very valid point. And I mean, you know, I, I, I for one, I think can note the irony that the main article that started all this appeared on LinkedIn, which was, you know, is perhaps one of the least secure platforms around. Um, yes. you know, or, <laughs> or perhaps I qualify that historically has been at least. And yeah, yeah I mean, I, I, so yeah, I think that's very true. I mean, do, I mean, one of the other sort of like conspiracy theories that I hear is that Clubhouse are carrying out lots of artificial intelligence on the conversations that we're having and they're actually you know then selling that data on to third party brokers now personally i don't believe that to be the case i believe there probably is some ai behind it but i don't i don't believe there's anything sinister in in that and, and as you say it, it's exactly the same really as as what facebook mm-hmm. has been doing to us all for years anyway with our consent yeah. And I think the other thing about that, these urban mishaps, that's really what we're talking about, isn't it? Yeah. Um, Agora.io, which is the platform built on, that Clubhouse is built on, does use AI. And so, but you have to effectively, it's like, you know, a flying binary, not a flying binary, but one of our AI, something like um, artificial emotional intelligence, which protects our children online, sure. protects our nations online is built on the Flying Binary platform. Clubhouse is built on the Agora platform. They're, that operates in one way. Um, you know, in Facebook's case, they have their own tech. Twitter has its own tech. Google has its own tech. But in Clubhouse's case, it's using this platform. Lots of things are built on that because this is the new wave of it's now voice and not tech. Yeah. Um, and so the, the reality of that is, yes, there's AI in there, but there's AI on the underpinning infrastructure, i.e. Agora, that Clubhouse is sat on. What are Clubhouse doing with what we're doing? Well, when you're in a room, not much, because it's just, it's a pop-up room. Like I say, mm. like, it's a little bit mm. like a pop-up, pop-up podcast, I yeah, think yeah. Know, or a pop-up talk show or something like that, yeah. except everybody gets a choice of, of contributing if they'd like. Um, and then, then longer term, what, they, what do they know about the data we're giving them? They know, because topics have recently been introduced, they know what topics are, sort of trending and popular yeah. that allows them to look at what they might host and what they might curate look at promoting the shows that are talking about the, the rooms that are talking about that and so yes they are understanding in a voice setting not text but in a voice setting what do we love at mm-hmm. the end of the day because we're the product that's what they're actually finding out sure yeah what do yeah. we love what do you know is a, is a show every thursday about dogs the, the top thing on Clubhouse, and if so, why, and what else might there be? And so they're effectively curating what's going on on the platform. But I just, you know, any urban myth about oh, you know, very sinister, and there's Chinese investment in that platform. There's Chinese investment in lots of things. Yeah. So why single out Clubhouse mm, for this? Mm. I think that a lot of this is urban myth because people are genuinely confused about what it is. So yeah. I often act as concierge. Some of my friends are I've got an invitation I act as concierge and I say to them let's just short circuit this I'll give you a five minute intro and then you won't waste any time on this and you'll find the value for yourself because actually it's very different yeah so I think some of the urban myths come from a misunderstanding and mm. it's different yeah I, I, I think I agree I mean I, I must be I've become somebody of a Trump house addict um <laughs> but <laughs> I, I I I just escape for, for, for a whole new group we've made in the Trump house anonymous but um it to me it's it certainly had the I think the most impact I can remember of any sim I, I mean as you say it's not similar to any other network but if, no. if we liken it to the only things we can liken it to to the Twitters of this world for example yeah then you know Twitter was actually quite a slow burn to to, to get it get it started but Clubhouse in some ways I I, I do I suppose in the back of my own mind, I do have a slight worry about whether it will become a victim of its own success because it's it seems to be growing quite exponentially, even though it's still in public beta. You, you, you know, and actually, and, it only came out of ours to meet the need because yeah. there were many of us. I mean, it's in essence, it meets the tech need. So it's my yeah. community that is a foundation of this, and we're quite used to popping up in in um, in Austin, Texas, to meet in South by Southwest and you know, have hosting something sure. in Tech City in London. We just get our gangs together. Yeah. And so in a pandemic, when it was in Alpha, there was quite frankly a push. Get it out yeah. there. We need to talk to one another. But then, you know, lots of people said, oh, so lovely, it's a human conversation. 
you know? Yeah. And, and actually it's met a need in the public for all of us to have mm. human conversations, meet folks who don't know. Um, and, you know, I've, I've popped into a couple of rooms of people I've not met before who've said it's Friday evening, what's everybody up to? That's mm. the sort of thing that in London or in Seattle or in Tokyo, we would meet somewhere and go, who's up for it? It's Friday evening. But actually, we're meeting online to do that. I, I, absolutely. Yeah, I, I fully agree. I think I think in some ways, it's you know, a product of its time that's come along at exactly the right time for, 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 exactly. for, for, for people. And yeah, it, it does have that great ability of, as you say, you know, you can go on there, you can meet some really interesting people, you can meet some yeah. bizarre people as well. It has to be said, but that's true. true about any platform. <laughs> yeah. um, but but I, what I think it does as well, and I, I was having this discussion in, in in a actually in a clubhouse room yesterday. We were talking about authenticity, and I said that actually I felt that it was one of the most authentic platforms that I'd ever yeah. come across because, you know, in the Twitters or, or the Facebooks of, of this world, particularly Facebook, I think it's fair to say, if you really wanted on Facebook, you can fake it till you make it. You, yeah. you, you, know, you, you, you can pretend to be whatever you want to be. You can put up a picture of yourself standing beside a Lamborghini that actually isn't yours or you've only hired it for the day. Yeah. Um, but you put over that projection of, 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 a, of a flash image. And to some degree, you can do the same thing on, it, on Instagram. Um, but Clubhouse isn't like that because a it's it's voice and you know uh, voice is let's face it one of the most basic human instincts that we have in, in in being able to communicate. Yeah. And so you can pick out people who you think that doesn't sound quite that doesn't sound quite quite right. Also, I think because the rooms are on the whole, um, you all, you have the danger if you're on the stage that someone could question you there and then in front of everyone else who's, who's in the room and they do and, and they do yeah and, yes. and so and so you know the opportunity to fake it is is not there yeah because you you'll, no. you'll, you'll you'll be found out um, and it's really interesting for me because i go into room they go oh josh jackie's here get her on stage we just want to ask you this i've no idea what they're going to ask you mm. so i said to her in, in a room um at the end of last week i said Let's just make this an AMA session. You know, there are lots of registers in the room. Yeah. They knew what I meant. I said, just ask me anything. Because obviously I have no idea what you're going to ask me. So ask me what you like. And I think that is brilliant because quite frankly, you you like issues of the day, tech is at the core of what we all do. And so it's like issues of the day, tell me what's concerning now. Let's have a look at that. And I just think that's a fantastic thing to be able yeah. to do. And then also, you know, um, what I found is... Um, other people have said, like, I had an influencer approach me, uh, an Instagram influencer approached me last week. They said, OK, I've been on there for three weeks. I have no idea what I'm doing. I'm seeing some of the most bizarre things going on. And, and I said, and that's about what people are selling on the platform. She went, how do you know that? I said, because I've seen it myself, thinking you just get yourself kicked off of the platform. Mm. So this is not this is a human to human thing. And it can't be that hard sell it's not a guru thing. It's, mm. it's actually a very big change to how we, how yeah. we as humans interact. And, and so I'm taking her through that process. And effectively, she does want to reach out to people, but she actually wants to understand what does anybody need here? Because I'm, I'm wanting to contribute. So I've got these three things. Does anybody need that? And if they don't need that, they need something else. Mm. I want to know how to contribute. She can't have that conversation on Instagram or Facebook. No, or Twitter, no. I, 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 but I, she can sort of reach out to folks and go, I'm doing this. Mm. Yeah, I, I think you're quite right. And I think as well, yeah, OK. We, we all know there are, unfortunately, and again, you did it on any platform, that, that there are some yeah. people who, are, who currently are gaming the system who, 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 who worked out that, hey, I can have five devices. I can be in five rooms at the same time. And I can pick up lots of followers because actually I won't respond until the moderator calls my name. And then I'll, I'll just respond into whichever device he, he or she has just called my name on. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, you know, now, OK, that that's each person to their own. Yeah, if, if they feel comfortable doing that, then so, so be it. But I think it's, you know, it, it's in a way, just a way of feeding their own ego because, you know, I think it, frankly, I would rather have 600 followers who actually were interested in what I had to say and were genuine followers than 6,000 yeah. followers who were never going to be my clients anyway in, in a month of Sundays. 
were never really going to be interested in what I had to say. They were just a, a, a vanity metric. Yeah. And, you, you know, if, if that's how you feel, you, if that's what floats your boat, well, you know, fill your boots. But, but it, Yeah, exactly. It, but, it, I mean, the majority of people on there are not tackling like that. I think one of the other urban missions was about the fact that the contact about the way in which the invitations work and the yeah, fact that, yeah. um, you know, people are concerned about that. And again, you know, if you are um, on that platform and it says one of your contacts has just joined and you don't have, and you have a problem with that, don't interact with it. Yeah. It takes, yeah. It, 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 literally within a minute, less than a minute, that notification goes away. You just ignore it. Mm. And, and effectively that's your, you deciding exactly how your um interaction with that mech that mechanism of onboarding works so uh, people have said to me well i've got a problem with that well ignore it then yeah. if, if actually you've got a problem with it generally turn the notifications off don't yeah. interact with it mm. will will clubhouse in some way do you down because of that no but the, the genuinely because it's a human to human thing like i say mm. i've acted as concierge yeah. people who i i practice you know, part of the Burning Man team or whatever, go, hi, it's me. They go, Jackie, is that really you? No, hang on again. Is this a recording? It's like, no, ask me a question and mm. I'll give you a real answer. And people are delighted at the Absolutely. idea yeah. that yeah. somebody they know is going to help them on board and give them the five top things they need to know about Clubhouse and they're off. And they can always come back to me if I need mm. it. I just think that's a human thing. Yeah. Like you say, that's part of that authentic thing you're talking about. Yeah. But you don't have a problem with the way the notifications work and you, and you think that that's an issue. Most things, most platforms will warn you about users coming on board, which you can take no notice of whatsoever, mm. but you might want to do something about. Yeah. So, for example, um, I always recommend for messaging be signal because I know the folks at Signal, I know how it works, and, and I know that I'm happy with the way in which the whole ecosystem works. And it warns me on that. Now, for some of those people, what I do is on Signal, I'll, I'll swipe right and I'll press delete. And that tells Signal I never want to know about those people on that platform again. So that gives me control of not just my own privacy, but who also knows I'm here. Sure, yeah. And I think yeah. that that is a, a control that most of the other social platforms don't have. No, no, I, th I think you're right. And I mean, I, I know from town hall discussions with, with um, Clubhouse, one of the things that they're looking at at the moment is how they can perfect this idea of, you know, at the moment, if you block someone, you don't see the rooms that they're, if they're on the stage, you don't see that room. Yeah. And what some yeah. people are saying, of course, is actually, well, that's not quite what I want. What I want is to be able to go in that room. I just don't want that person to know that I'm, Correct. That, that I'm there. And and yeah, I think the things like that, which in in the fullness of time, will will come out. But again, one one of the things which I I would remind people on that is that you know it is still a beta. It, it, you know, it, it's still underactive. <laughs> and over. really, if we're it's, being kind to the founders, it's an alpha that we've pushed them to release yes, yeah. because it's helped. And I think you know, I had a GPR conversation on Clubhouse in with a German colleague last week that went along the lines of another urban myth that went along the lines of, I couldn't possibly support a platform. Have you got an invitation? No, well, that tends to be the answer for that. I couldn't possibly support a platform that's iOS only. It's beta and the money is already in and they're working on the Android version. Mm. No, anything that tells me what tech I've got, I couldn't possibly go on. I said, so you, so basically you don't have a single iOS device in your house? Oh, I do. Okay, then, well, why don't, what do you have? iPad. Why don't you do that, download the app on your iPad? Yeah. Well, can I do that? Uh, yes. Yes. Uh, yeah. And so it's like, you know, so suddenly from being, I can't possibly deal with a platform that doesn't do Android. As soon as she finds out she can use it on any iOS, then she's downloading the app and looking for an invite to Clubhouse. Mm. So I think yeah. that, you know, one of those things are, the, you, re, you read this stuff, but what's behind it all? Yeah. What's I behind agree. it all? I mean, I'm a, I'm I develop tech if I was going to choose between the platforms from a privacy and security point of view I mean we don't what we don't do native apps anyway because we work on the accessibility uh, requirements we've got 880 million people in Europe that need other requirements and it's very hard to do via the native app so we don't build apps like that but if we did then we'd go for iOS first mm. because from a privacy yeah. and security point of view I would get it settled on that i would understand what it is but for something like this agora is what you use because it's a voice app yeah that's not yeah. what native apps about and i said to her 
you're misunderstanding. This is not two ecosystems, you know, uh, Apple versus Google anymore. This is Agora's now in the thing. Mm. She said, well, I don't really understand that. So because it's about voice. Um, but she said, well, it doesn't really matter. I should just get the app on my iPad now. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> so I'm not it, sure anybody's actually concerned about well, that. It, 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 it's, like, <laughs> it, it, it's like I was trying to explain to somebody um, last week, I think, or the week before, about why it's not a good idea if you're if you're the person who opens the room to make absolutely everyone who comes up on the stage a moderator. Yeah, oh, because, definitely not. No, because there's a danger that you will get thrown out of your own room because that you know you're giving them that capability. Now you can get back in, but that's a, that's a different issue. Yeah. But you know why would you do that? And I, I think again, it's it's you know, and I, I'm not going to name names, but we all know the sort of people who I mean who. We're not going to room unless they get their green badge because that 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 fulfills their ego that they are you know they, they are a moderator. Um, right. Well, so be it. Yeah, I, I mean I, I have a couple of rooms that I run, but if there's rooms that other rooms that I go into and the person running the stage wants to make me a moderator, well, great. But if he doesn't, mm. I, I don't mind that either. You, you know. No, it, it, and I think it's got to be that two way thing you're talking mm. about, and, it, and underpinning the point you made about authentic. But I do think underpinning all of this is a misunderstanding about what this platform yeah. does. This platform allows humans to have a human conversation about topics that matter to them, and nowhere else can you do that. But this is the beginning of that future. So for Inside Flying Binary, we we have capability that does that at a global level. We do it with uh, every image, every video, in order to be able to create a safer world. And that's what you know our tech's done since 2009. So yes, most people have only just come across this in 2020. It's actually been around for a very long mm, time. Yeah. Um, and But this is the almost, I would say, the online world growing up and becoming yeah. more human mm. and less curated by tech and um, more about what you need like you say in the town halls it's like well we're thinking of doing this we're thinking of doing that yeah they're genuinely getting the community together going what do you need mm. and obviously some of us are very loud going i need this now yeah. um but but they, they're gonna get there and i yeah, think I, the I, fact I, that I, they've I, had such a good take up means they will yeah absolutely and and, and the, the, you know for me as well i think one of the things is is that it's very rare that we get a platform where so many, it always seems a contradiction in terms, but so many of us get to be early adopters. And, right. You know, yeah. and, and But being the early adopters means that A, we can shape the, the, yes. the, the way it's going. And B, I think as well, you know, it, undoubtedly, it opens the opportunity for conversations with, with individuals who, and real voice conversations, not just the, yes. you know, the, the <laughs> typing, with individuals, if frankly, otherwise you would you would never get to talk to. Yes. Yeah. And um, yeah. I mean, I, I I will plug one of my one of my um, clubhouse rooms here, which is rebuild the high street on a Tuesday. And right. on, on and on that now we have estimate Bay, who was a cabinet minister and is now a regular panelist on on that room. Right. And equally, though, also a regular panelist in the room is Marcus Bridstock, the comedian. So you know you you know now I. I like to think I'm fairly well connected, but I would never have been able to get those two together in the same room. No. In, in, no. in, in the physical world. Yeah, it just yeah. wouldn't happen. Yeah. Because one of And I think this is one of the reasons, you know, one of the, you know, the key things we're all starting to think differently. We're in circumstances requires that of us. How long will we be like this? Well, for the, for the short term, at least, maybe the medium term. And in the meantime, what could we do to improve what we're doing? And it's about subjects we care about, which is obviously one of those, you know, that's one of the subjects for you. Mm. And I think that um, that's the opportunity around it. It's very funny because somebody said to me um, yesterday, they said, what's wrong with your profile on Clubhouse? It's like, oh, mine's a tech profile. <laughs> I haven't bothered with any of that stuff you're all doing. But I've had so many people say that to me now. I will actually have to update it. But it just says who I am, which my own tech yeah. community go, oh, it's not tricky. Yeah, I know yeah. what she's about. And they don't need any more explanation. No. Other people are like, what is that? Um, but but because we're the foundation of that platform, it's got that vibe with it. But yeah. essentially, people that are not in our communities that wouldn't normally get, we wouldn't normally get to speak to, they're, they're the people that are popping up on in our rooms. I think it's mm. fantastic. I really do. And yeah. then I've had, uh, the other thing is, I've had people reach out to me, and I'm sure you have as well, Keith, who've said, 
you you know you're the first person that's talked sense about this and has talked about options yeah. around this mm. and actually can we go off platform and have that conversation mm. and i think that that means that you'll meet people who not just care about what you do like the, the the topic you just mentioned but also actually want to move on with things yeah. so yes it's a platform you can you can get leads from and make money from but that's not its primary purpose no no. And I think you've got to do that. One of the things I've said to the influencer I'm working with is we need to do that with caution. At the point in which you've got the offering that you're finding out about now, how you advertise that um, and how you showcase that yeah. is going to yeah. be a bit different. Sure. So I think yeah. that that's the key uh, thing. Because I think, you know, in the back of everybody's mind is, you know, ultimately one day, how 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 is it going to be monetized for for mm. as, as a platform as a whole? And, you know, there's different theories floating around on that. But I think that's something you know we we need to wait and see how it develops. But I think you know to 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 take a phrase actually from BNI, but but I think it is you know it is a real givers gain platform. And the more you're prepared yes. to give, the more you gain f- yes. from it. Absolutely. And if you're not prepared to give, if you just and I, I think again that's one of the great things about the platform to me is that. If you want to go on there and just go in rooms and just sit there quietly and listen, you can. Yeah, yes. no, yes. no, no one's saying, "Hey, you, you know, you, you, you come in, you come in ten rooms now. You need to be up on stage talking to people." No, no, it, and it, actually, I think that it also almost helps you develop what you are interested in mm. that may not be anything connected to your day job, like you know, you said about the the high street, piece. yeah, and 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 that's topics that from all over the world people are interested in. So I sort of said, well, I find my gang on there because they're talking about stuff I care about. Yeah. And if yeah. they're not, well, I'll pop up a room and we'll talk about it together. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So I think, Keith, where we talked before the be- at the beginning of this, we'll probably pop this up, this conversation up in Clubhouse itself. Why yeah. wouldn't we do that? Because, mm. again, there'll be a different audience. And then yeah. some of your you know, GDPR audience, if they're on Clubhouse, perhaps they want to come in, pitch in, and it'd be great to hear some of you folks contribute to this discussion. I think uh, that's, uh, a, you know, that's, we do this in a podcast, but a clubhouse room, we could yeah. actually all have a, have a general feedback on this. Uh, 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 absolutely. I, I think, yeah, it's a great idea that. And, and yeah, it, for those people listening, please do join us on Clubhouse for the live follow up to this interview. The room on Clubhouse is on Monday, the 1st of March at 6 p.m. UK time. And you can find it if you search for GDPR Weekly Show on Clubhouse. The room itself is called GDPR Weekly Show Clubhouse. Are you cyber safe? And we'd love to see as many people there as possible. And we will also be putting a link to the room on Clubhouse in the listings of both this week's podcast and next week's. So if you are not yet a member of Clubhouse and you'd like to join us and you have an Apple device, either an iPad or an iPhone, please go to the link and you'll be admitted to Clubhouse. And yeah, please do, you know, whatever your view is, please do come along because, yeah. you know, the discussion is, is, a, is a very beast. And, and yeah, if, if people have different views, let's hear those views and, and let's... Love to. Love you, to you know, hear that. Let, 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 let's see what what is there. You know, is some of it just things that aren't being explained very well? Has somebody actually spotted a loophole, which, you know, frankly, we've missed because sometimes you can be... Um, you know, as as they were saying, you can't see the wood for the trees. But you you, mm-hmm. you, you, you know, so let's let, let's do that. So yeah, I'd, I'd be delighted to, to 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 do that. So let's move away from Clubhouse now and and talk about and mm-hmm. uh, talk about other things. Um, I, I guess really the, the the main thing is, um, and again, this is something we were talking about before the interview, but but it's about the whole issue of Schrems two and the yeah. data transfer to the US. So. Yeah. Um, what's your understanding, Jackie, of, of where we're at on that at the minute? And what, what would your advice be to companies to what they sh- should be doing? Well, we're not anywhere. So if that's where you thought we were, that's where we are. Um, so as a, as a company, Flying Binary, we made a strategic shift back in 2017. We see GDPR as, a, as an opportunity. We see it as a unique selling point for our company. But the Privacy Shield, after the safe harbour arrangements were junked and we got the Privacy Shield, I couldn't see how going forward this would be on challenge. I didn't feel it was a tenable foundation for us as a company. So we now offer, uh, we have no privacy shield dependency for any of our tech. And that's our base offer. So I was talking to a client this morning and essentially they are mandating that we, that we use that privacy shield. 
um, as part of the, the contract that they're giving them. And so what I said to them was that, you know, we'll be joint data controllers. That is something that I have, um, from a flying binary point of view, offered you a service that has none of that. You, as my client, are mandating that we do that. Um, that's fine. It needs to be written in the contract. And I need an acknowledgement in that contract that that's despite the trend to judgment. So we've had this conversation. I mean, I've obviously got email around this because I followed up with an email. But the, the we've had this conversation. And despite the trend to judgment, you've mandated me or our company as joint controllers to do it this way. Because I actually think one of the things with any of this regulation is being clear about the actions you've taken and why. So if I can lay on the table if there's ever any query about it and say, here's the contract that said I had to do it this way, even though they have an option uh, without uh, to do it without the privacy shields, they have taken the, they have not taken that option. Now, it's not because it's any more expensive, it's just a different way of doing things. Sure. But we are advising all of our clients that if they are going to be dependent on it, they make that sort of, um, uh, they, they make that sort of statement in contractual um, place, because I don't think it's safe to build on and, be, and from a technology point of view, you don't have to either. Um, uh, we, we are, uh, from a European point of view, the only company that does this. But equally, you know, we're talking to clients that don't normally come into our world who are saying, we don't see this as a foundation either. And we've heard, you know, we've been referred from such a client in Europe who said, well, flying binary will get you out of this mess and, and, and can uh, put a path forward. And so we're having those conversations now. And, and do I think that's going to be changed soon? No, because I don't know what the answer is. Mm. We have, you know, safe harbor to privacy shield to whatever number three is. But why would that be any different? You know, um, we've got CCPA in California now. But let's not be clear. There's no way that the U.S. has, has moved forward on this agenda. No. Um, and so, so the conditions for anything that would overturn that trend judgment is not in place. So I'm saying to clients, particularly if you're a data processor or you're a joint data controller, um, you really do need to have some good reason as to why you're going and having, why you've got reliance on that privacy shield. Because I don't think it's defensible. And then of course, where are you? Um, and of course, you know, we, we're waiting to see what happens. Yeah. But I don't think that's any time soon either. Um, and I'm, I'm keen to put my details on here. If anybody wants to talk about specifics, because obviously I'm really generalizing here, um, we, we're having conversations across many sectors, across many countries um, around the sort of European data issue with Trends 2. And um, I've spent time last week in Japan, for example, talking about it, who have a very similar implementation of GDPR, but equally some of what they do is US bound. Mm. How does that work? So I think that it's something that is incumbent on us all to have a conversation, get some advice on. And um, I would follow through with the sorts of things that Keith normally expects you to do in terms of documentation, recording it, all of those things, because I think it will come under question. And, and I, can I see an easy out for this? No, I I'd, I'd think going forward, it has to be another another arrangement. Now, obviously, in the UK, we're fairly... Um, we're fairly clear on what we have and all of our on-soil capability is now in the UK or is globally bound. But we, we don't use that as a means of underwriting any service provision that we have um, because we would be um, we would be liable for that judgment. Um, but a client advising us we have to, making it a contract clause, that's what something they can do. They take on that responsibility at that point. Sure. Yeah, that's, that's really good. And of course, the other... Um elephant in the room if you like is the whole question of eu adequacy and and what mm, will happen yes. um at the end of april or the end of june because doubtless it will go to the extended two months because as we know with, with the european union that's the way they like to play these things as demonstrated by the trade deal which you know came out on christmas eve in the end um <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so the, yes the, the lisbon uh, method is what it's generally called i signed at the last minute with no preparation and, and i think you should plan on that. What Keith yeah. just said, you should plan that to the case. Um, so, yeah, I, I mean, but the interesting situation there, Jackie, which I came across, is, is this whole situation with the Channel Islands and the fact that they obviously right. never were part of the EU. And so they they already have a data adequacy agreement with, with yeah. the EU. 
And indeed, to, to my surprise, they actually have a data. I, I just assumed that they sort of exchange data with the UK under the normal legislation, but they actually have a data literacy agreement with the UK. Mm -hmm. uh, and we, you know, we, we know that there, there is at least one Channel Islands politician who's playing, you know, his, his chance to stand on his soapbox about this and say, we may not accept the UK as adequate. Now, personally, I can't see any way that would ever happen, but, but just like your feel on, on, right. on that. And I think it's a really good point. I mean, first thing we, we um, I need to say on this is the UK have deemed the EU as adequate. So let's just clear that yeah. out. We did that as part of negotiations. There was no query about that. We went into a final deal knowing that that was, um, that, that was the case. Um, but the, the reality of it is, is I don't, I can see why it might be a political play to do what's been done, but who wins? At the end of the day, uh, all of the reason why, you know, why we're talking about this is this is the future of the way our world will work. So why would we not have um, an adequate decision when other countries that have never been EU members, and we've changed nothing much about what we do, have already got it? So why would we have that? And, and, and who gained that mm. would be my question. And I would think nobody gains it. And the people that stand to, to the disbenefit is for us citizens. And at the end of the day, this is about creating a, an underpinning for our society where we can all with confidence get on and do what we need to do because this is all being taken care of. So the idea of playing sort of tit for tat, will this, or, you know, we, we're not going to honour this piece, we won't have that. I can't see who gains from that. No. Um, what I would say is um, obviously we have to keep an eye on it. Obviously the ICO is doing the same thing, but the, we should assume that there would be adequacy or we will make an arrangement that says what we will do. But yeah. the idea that in some ways, you know, the channel lines are not going to be part of that, you know, that makes no sense whatsoever. We've, we've done everything we've done with Brexit in consideration of, of, you know, the island of Ireland and the Northern Ireland situation, which is complicated and still not mm -hmm. sorted. Mm -hmm. But the reality of it is we've all said, you know, 50% of, of Ireland's trade is with us. So why wouldn't we, you know, move yeah. forward on that? Everybody needs to prosper. And I would say in this pandemic, more than ever, we need to have a view about what value we can bring by making pragmatic decisions. But you're right, Keith, I suspect it'd be right at the wire again. What could we do? Just make sure you've got a note in your diary to say, you know, I would say the beginning of June, but earlier if you want another note as well, saying let's check where we're at with that. Let's see yeah. where we are. But the reality of it is the UK seeing the EU adequate why would that not be received? Yeah, it makes no sense. No, I, I I totally agree with you. So just just to just to finish, then Jackie, you know, I always like to teach you on on trying to get a little bit <laughs> of you on, on on what what I still thinking is and what what things might be coming up. So is, is there anything you right. can sort of? Uh, I can know, tell you give us a hint on. So, so yeah, they, I probably should. So um, so I think some of your listeners may be heard on the on the other podcast I did that we are um, experts in artificial intelligence. So yeah. we have very much taken a regulatory approach to the way we deploy AI tech, but one step further than that, the way we design it. So we design it with privacy preserving uh, approaches and um, we have got a new intervention that builds on all of our regulatory technology to um, actually take the next steps around GDPR. Um, so we're currently in negotiations about that. It's, it's, it's really taking um, a lead on, I believe, as companies, the responsibilities we all have when we're delivering any sort of service to actually move us all forward as a society. And so we, Slime Van has made an investment in that. We've had cooperation and collaboration from a regulatory point of view on that. And um, let's just say, Keith, when the announcement's made, your listeners will be the first. I'll come on here and tell them. Excellent. But it's a very exciting... It's a very exciting play because I do believe it's probably one of the areas that most of your listeners won't have much preparation in, won't have much knowledge in. And, and it really does reinforce um, GDPR for the whole of our society. So I'm binary, I may not have said, is focused on an inclusion mission. And by that, we mean leave no one behind. And so this is our intervention to research and development piece that we've done and that we're, we're collaborating with from a regulatory point of view. But I believe it will create the use cases and the guidance for everybody else 
to see why this is important and how it improves their own business. So we've done it obviously because it's part of our USP to be a reg tech company, but I do believe this is an area that people have found difficult. And so we've made a proposal about how we might do this. And uh, I promise to come back on your show and and, and spill the beans when I'm allowed. <laughs> Fantastic. Thanks, thanks Kathy. I really appreciate that. So as always, Dr. Kathy Taylor, an, an excellent guest on, on the show. Thank you once again, Jesse, for, for sparing your time and, and coming on to, to the show. It's brilliant, Keith. I'd delight to be uh, doing this with you again. I think I think the GDPR meets big tech and tech or whatever. We, you know, a regular session on that. I'm more than happy to do because some of these issues are quite complicated, as yeah. we've demonstrated today. And and I'm more than happy to sort of um, sort of partner with you on this and and let's have the discussion. And then if we can take a Q and A on Clubhouse, I think that'll be really cool. Yeah, fantastic. <laughs> thanks, Jackie. All right, thanks, Keith. And now, the rest of this week's news. In a surprise move on Friday this week, the European Commission published two draft implementing decisions to enable the continuing free flow of personal data from the EU to the UK, the draft adequacy decisions. That these have been published so early will come as a big relief to lots of companies and organisations in the UK. And the draft adequacy decisions, which collectively run to almost 140 pages, are the first of their kind since REMS 2 and will likely be closely reviewed, including by privacy advocate Matt Srems, who has promised his Twitter followers to take a look at the draft adequacy decisions, in particular with regard to the UK government surveillance activities. The UK adequacy agreement, providing it comes into place, will put us as the 13th country to be deemed adequate by the EC, the others including Argentina, Canada, Israel, Switzerland and most recently Japan. So as we've mentioned previously on the GDPR Weekly Show, at the moment we're in a transition period as far as GDPR is concerned, with an interim grace period of up to four months from the 1st of January 2021, with an extension of another possible two months, which in total would bring us up to July 2021 before our current adequacy agreement with the EU would expire. Now, it should be worth pointing out that this is only from the EU to the UK. The UK has already declared the EU an adequate country as far as the UK is concerned, so there's no problem with data transfers from the UK to the EU. It's solely the other way around. In coming to its decision... The European Commission says that it looked at the UK's constitutional framework, including the existence of the UK Human Rights Act 1998, which incorporates the rights contained in the European Convention on Human Rights. It looked at the UK's data protection framework, in particular the fact that EU GDPR has been incorporated into UK law, of course because now we talk about UK GDPR, and as such the UK's legislative framework for data protection is closely aligned to EU GDPR. It also looked at onward transfers of personal data from the UK and in particular the fact that the same restrictions on international transfers of personal data under EU GDPR are provided for in UK GDPR, particularly in relation to transfers of data to third countries, for example the USA. They also looked at oversight and enforcement and were satisfied that the existence of the UK Information Commissioner's Office, the ICO, as an independent supervisory authority tasked with powers to monitor and enforce compliance with the data protection rules was a suitable body to oversee UK GDPR and they also looked at redress, the requirement that individuals are provided with effective administration and judicial redress including compensation for damages. The EC here references the ability for the data subject to firstly complain to and about the ICO, secondly bring a claim against controllers and processors for material and non-material damage under UK GDPR and thirdly to bring a claim in UK courts under UK Human Rights Act 1998 and ultimately the European Court of Human Rights. The sticking point was thought to have been the extra availability in UK GDPR for UK government authorities to effectively snoop on the data that was being transferred. However, the EC has assessed this and says that through membership of the Council of Europe, adherence to the European Convention on Human Rights and submission to the jurisdiction of the European Court of Human Rights, the UK is subject to a number of obligations enshrined in international law that frame its system of government access on the basis of principles, safeguards and individual rights, similar to those granted under EU law and applicable to the member states. The EU further accepted 
that the scope of the UK State Protection Act 2018, which applies also to personal data processed by public authorities, including by law enforcement and national security bodies, and which in turn guarantees specific data protection and safeguards and rights. So now that we have this draft adequacy, what happens now? Well, the draft adequacy decision will now be reviewed by the European Data Protection Board, the EDPB. The EC will take into account, but is not bound by, the EDPB's decision. And then following that, the draft literacy decision will be submitted to a committee comprised of representatives from all EU member states to provide a form of opinion using the form of a vote on the draft literacy decisions. The EC is then able to adopt the draft literacy decisions. Once adopted, the draft literacy decisions will be valid for four years. After four years, we go through the whole process again and the EU has to satisfy itself that the UK remains an adequate country as far as GDPR is concerned. It's also possible, though, that following the adoption of the draft adequacy decisions, applications for annulment will be lodged within two months and ten days of publication by privacy activist groups. There may also be complaints made to data protection authorities in the EU and national courts that could threaten continued adequacy determination. But for the time being, the publication of draft adequacy decisions is definitely good news and a step forward, and of course something we would keep a continual eye on here at the GDPR Weekly Show and bring you updates as and when they become available. Contact us on helpdesk at gdprweeklyshow.com or phone us on 0800-808-5312. The Leave.eu campaign and the insurance company owned by the political group's key financial backer, Aaron Banks, have lost an appeal against £105,000 of fines for data protection violations in the wake of the EU referendum campaign. The fines were issued two years ago for including promotions for banks Joe Skippy insurance brand in emails to Leave.eu subscribers between August 2016 and February 2017. The Information Commissioner's Office, the ICO, had said at the time that the two organisations were closely linked with ineffective systems for segregating the data of insurance customers from that of political subscribers. Leave.eu was also fined £15,000 for using Alden Insurance customers' details unlawfully to send out almost 300,000 political marketing messages before the referendum. An initial appeal against that ruling was withdrawn in May 2019. When the fines and the audit into both companies' use of data was announced in February 2019, the Information Commissioner Elizabeth Denham said it is deeply concerning that sensitive personal data gathered for political purposes was later used for insurance purposes and vice versa. It should never have happened. The fines against which Leave.eu and Alvin Insurance had tried to appeal in the latest case were for sending more than 1 million emails to Leave.eu subscribers containing adverts for discounted insurance firm Go Skippy, a brand name used by Alvin Insurance. The campaign negligently disobeyed electronic marketing regulations in doing so. The latest tribunal will be noted findings of a previous court that both companies have a confusingly two-faced approach to regulation of personal data. It also noted that banks had admitted being untruthful and used a bullying tone in correspondence about the case. Mr Banks' letter to the Information Commissioner admitting that he had been untruthful in the past was hardly likely to assuage all regulatory concerns, especially as it followed his letter of bullying tone. Banks said Leave.eu and Alvin Insurance will be appealing the fines to a higher court in due course. He said the ruling as it stood would prevent newspapers and publishers from sending offers to their subscribers. The judges had addressed this argument saying that Leave.eu's privacy policy was so loosely drafted it amounted to signing a blank cheque and frustrated the ability of its subscribers to consent to receive a political newsletter and nothing else. Because of this, the lower tribunal had been entitled to find on the facts that subscribers did not consent as that term is probably understood, to receive indirect marketing about Alden's insurance. The judges also said that previous breaches of data protection law at Leave.eu and Alden Insurance should have put both parties on guard. The fines were initially announced as part of a wide-ranging investigation by the ICO into political users of voters' data launched in 2017 following revelations in the Observer newspaper. Elizabeth Denham, the Commissioner, said it uncovered a disturbing disregard for voters' personal privacy and showed that the digital electoral ecosystem needed reform. The ICO's original investigation involved 71 witnesses, 30 organisations with data practices under review and more than 700 terabytes of data being assessed by investigators. If Mr Banks does appeal again to a higher court, we will of course keep you updated in future episodes of the GDPR Weekly Show. You're listening to the GDPR Weekly Show with your host, Keith Budden. 
Scottish Borders Council has apologised for a data breach which has affected about 600 customers. The council had been in the process of alerting about 1,300 residents that they were eligible for payment due to the receipt of free store meals. However, it sent three emails with all the recipients' email addresses visible to multiple individuals. The council apologised unreservedly for the breach and any distress or embarrassment caused. A spokesperson for the council said, Those customers who have received an email which includes other emails' addresses are asked to delete it. All payments will be made as planned to these individuals. Individual email addresses were disclosed. This is personal information. The content of the email will also outline what eligibility for the payment was due to the receipt of free store meals, which we absolutely appreciate is a sensitive matter for individuals. We are taking the incident very seriously and have discussed it with the Information Commissioner's Office. We are taking steps to put in place a technical solution to minimise the chances of a similar incident occurring again. Anyone affected with specifically additional concerns should contact the Council's Data Protection Team on data protection at stopborders.gov.uk or call 0300 100 1800. That's 0300 100 1800. All those eligible for the payment will be contacted to confirm eligibility before the end of this week. If we receive any update either from Borders Council or the ICO, we will of course bring it to you in the next available episode of the GD Public Show. Stay in, stay safe. Police Scotland has launched an investigation after more than 130 NHS workers had their medical records breached. A staff member has been interviewed by NHS Lothian after accessing the records, potentially obtaining information about medical conditions, appointments and waiting lists before the matter was referred to police. The breach was detected when a routine monitoring system picked up unusual activity showing a staff member viewed the medical records of other staff members outside of their normal duties. More than 150 people were sent letters saying records have been accessed between January and February to protect the identity of the person involved. Dr Tracy Gills, Medical Director of NHS Lothian, wrote, I am very sorry to inform you that during the routine monthly audit of staff access to computerised records, we identified a member of staff viewed your patient record when it was potentially not part of their normal duties. We have a duty to inform you of this and assure you that we regard this very seriously. The member of staff was dealt with through the appropriate disciplinary procedure in NHS Lothian. Due to the seriousness with which we view any breach of patient confidentiality, this matter has also been referred to the police, the Information Commissioner's Office and the staff members' regulatory body. Staff members have not been able to identify the colleague who accessed the records as the matter has now been handed to Police Scotland. Dr Dillis said NHS Lothian has become aware that member staff may have inappropriately accessed staff records. We swiftly started an inquiry into the matter and as part of this investigation we are contacting anyone whose records have been accessed. NHS Lothian takes incidents like this extremely seriously and we have written to offer our sincere apologies to those affected. The breach was picked up by our fair warning system which is an e-house monitoring system. Our robust monitoring identified this activity and it was reported to Police Scotland as soon as we became aware of the breach. We will continue to work closely with Police Scotland and the Scottish Information Commissioner to resolve this matter. As this is now a police matter we are unable to offer any further comment. If we receive any update on this from Police Scotland we will talk to you in the next available episode of the Chief Public Show. Please do join us on Clubhouse for the live follow-up to our interview with Dr Jackie Taylor. The room on Clubhouse is on Monday the 1st of March at 6pm UK time and you can find it if you search for GDPR Weekly Show on Clubhouse. The room itself is called GDPR Weekly Show Clubhouse Are You Cyber Safe? And we'd love to see as many people there as possible and we will also be putting a link to the room on Clubhouse in the listings of both this week's podcast and next week's. So if you are not yet a member of Clubhouse and you'd like to join us and you have an Apple device, either an iPad or an iPhone, please go to the link and you'll be admitted to Clubhouse. Contact us on helpdesk at gdprweeklyshow.com or phone us on 0800 808 5312. The GDPR Weekly Show is an insurance production. Until next time, bye-bye.